So good afternoon and good morning, uh, and I guess good evening if anyone is signing in from uh, from South Asia. Uh, welcome to the class today. We're glad that you are here. My name is Erin, and I'm the course coordinator. I just wanted to make an announcement regarding the makeup quizzes. I just recently shared the link for the 11 sessions. Uh, if you have missed a session, what we require you to do is to listen to the pre the, the recorded uh, call that is uploaded on YouTube and then make your best attempt to complete the quiz. The quiz is five questions and you'll see on the Google form, uh, there's an option to click on the week that you missed. There may be people that have missed multiple weeks, we do understand, related to internet connection or if you're not feeling well, um, that's okay. So what we just require to uh, attain a completion certificate or a certificate of completion of this course is that you put the effort in to listen to the hour or hour and a half call and then answer some questions. During our live calls, we, of course, you know, we have discussion time where people can answer questions and engage. So we want to make sure that you still have the opportunity to do that. Um, uh, over the next month, we will be going through the attendance and we'll be uh, uh, following up with that. So please be aware that I won't be able to update um, people who miss classes, but then we're able to complete the quiz uh, in real time. It's gonna take a bit of time. The course is quite large um, and it's only me and, and one other colleague that will be doing those administrative tasks. So. If you have any specific questions about your case, the best place uh, for me to follow up is by email. It's easier than WhatsApp, uh, but I will I will try to follow up with each one of the, the concerns in the case because we want to make sure that you feel confident in the content and at the end of this, that you are proud uh, to have that completion certificate. So thank you everyone. I know there also were quite a few people that were not on our attendance list. We will definitely update that and uh, and we'll make sure we follow up with that. That's no problem at all. So welcome today and I'll pass it over to Dr. Esther. Thanks everyone. Hello everyone. Uh, welcome to today's session. It's our last session and uh, we have quite uh, interesting things prepared. We want to look for support uh, at support for healthcare teams relating to the way we care for patients. So basically it's an open session and we are looking at debriefing self-care and how to support one another. So I would like to welcome Dr. Megan and Dr. Nicola to start off with the presentation for this afternoon. Over to you, Dr. Megan. Thank you, Dr. Esther. Very nice to see you all again today. A warm welcome from Canada, where I am these days. So we have three things we want to um, be able to do after today's session. Um, so we hope that after today, after Dr. Nicola and I share and we have our discussion, you'll be able to explain what is self-care and why it is important. Identify challenging clinical experiences that happen in your own practice and then hopefully develop some self-care strategies and a plan for how you can make sure that you can maintain your ability to care for patients. I want to start with this quote. The expectation that we can be immersed in suffering and loss daily and not be touched by it is as unrealistic as expecting to be able to walk through water without getting wet. So I think that really sets the scene for what we're doing here. We're when we care for patients who are seriously ill, who have chronic diseases like cancer and diabetes, there's a lot of suffering. And we can't go through that every single day and not be touched by it, right? You, you, you can't walk in the rain without getting wet is kind of the idea. So we have to figure out how are we going to cope and manage that suffering that we experience and how it touches us. So today is going to be quite interactive. Uh, because I want you, it's really about taking action and thinking about your own practice. So there's going to be several reflection points where I ask you to stop and think, and I'm going to take responses from uh, the chat and from anyone who's willing to share. So this is the first point like that. So I want you to think, what causes you distress in your job? Or what are the places, you know, in that quote we said, um, it says immersed in suffering and loss. So what do you see in your work 
that cause that where you ex see that suffering and loss. So tell me that answer that question. Think about that and write your responses in the chat. What are the difficult things that you have to deal with in your job? It doesn't have to just be the patients. It could be things like the workload is very high. There's just so many patients. I have to rush with every patient. Great, I'm starting to see people sharing. I'll read them out in a moment. I'll give people time to think. Okay, so I see a few people have shared. I'm gonna grade out their responses. Thank you very much for sharing. I might not be able to read them all, but I'll read a few. The dichotomy of being professional at the same time, feeling the loss, just like the family who suffered the loss in due course of taking care of the patients. So, so I think just the sadness of the loss of your patient. Often having to carry the burden alone, says Susan, without feeling supported. Elizabeth says death, distressing procedures. Andrada says death of young children. Leah says tense work environment. Lack of teamwork from Dr. Kentong. Sometimes just looking at suffering that seems unyielding to care from Anne Fiona. I, when I cry because a child has died, it's seen as uncomfortable by colleagues. Uncooperative client and family members, heavy workload. Sudden loss of a patient I expected to survive. Knowing treatment options available, but not able to give due to restricted access, listening to patient losses. So thank you for sharing those. There are many, many things that you've shared that are really important. And the first step in self-care is identifying those things in your work. And if we think about palliative medicine more generally, there are a lot of stressors that might just come from being in palliative medicine or doing palliative care. You know, things like feeling that you're not doing a good enough job. You have a lot of exposure to death and suffering. Uh, communication can be really hard, right? Sometimes you talk to the family and you tell them what's going on and they don't believe you. Team conflicts that you brought up, lack of support and work overload. And I want to speak to work overload, because if you're working in humanitarian settings, sometimes there are just so many patients and you can't always do a good job with every patient. It's just not humanly possible. There aren't enough hours in a day. And I think somebody spoke to that in their in their comment in the chat, just that feeling of like the suffering that just doesn't there's no end to it. Right. Um, so what. I think a coping strategy for this specifically um, is to do one good thing every day that you feel like I did a good job for this patient. I really helped them. I gave them that little bit more time and counseled them or something like that. And then to take that thing and know when you go home at the end of the day and you're exhausted, say, I did good for that patient. I did well for that patient. Um, and so that I think many people have told me and I use that strategy myself when working in situations where there are just too many patients to address all of their issues. People have told me as well that that's effective. So why do we need to talk about self care. I think all the things you've written in the chat really tell us that we need to it's difficult. Patients will die despite our best efforts. And we, we know that pain and suffering or pain and sadness is inevitable in our work. You know, you wouldn't be human if you weren't touched by this. It's, it's part of the work is to see that suffering is to experience it. Like we said, you have to walk, you have to get wet if you walk in the rain. <coughs> but we can learn to manage that suffering and give ourselves some protective factors. <coughs> Sorry. So let's use this little quiz to see how we're doing on our well-being. So this is the WHO well-being index. So I'd like everyone to look at it 
And for each of the five questions, you give yourself a score of zero to five, and then their total score will be out of 25. So I'm gonna pause now and ask everyone to try and do that and figure out what your score would be out of 25. Okay, so thank you. Yes, please share your scores in the chat. What did you give your score? If you feel comfortable, you can just share your score. I see some scores coming in. And here's it, just another version of it. People are giving scores, 10, 14, 16, 13. Good. Thank you for sharing. So this is a really quick self-administered score that you can use when you're working with your team, maybe just to check in with everybody. How are we doing? Everyone can look at their score. And then sometimes people say, okay, then you can multiply your score by, by four to get a score out of 100, because um, then it's like percent kind of. And then you can look at that, if, you know, a score of 50 out of 100, if you multiply these scores that you're sharing by four would be um, you know a score that suggests maybe there's some some issues with your well-being and you can monitor and if you have a 10 percent change then maybe there's a there's a uh, something significant going on so let's think about a few common responses that we might have to all the stress that you shared so one is burnout um, which is a common term these days um, since COVID started, you know, there's all this news about uh, healthcare providers being burnt out. And this is the definition that somebody has developed, a progressive loss of idealism, energy, and purpose experienced by people in the helping professions as a result of the conditions of their work. People describe feeling physically and emotionally exhausted and a depersonalized response approach towards patients where you just see every patient as kind of like not an individual just another number you have to deal with sometimes people feel incompetent or they just feel like they can't get anything done and then there's two other things that sometimes come up moral distress and some people have shared in the chat about this moral distress i'm sorry uh, is the inability to act in a manner consistent with your values so you have moral distress um, like one of the participants shared in the chat, when you know you know there's a treatment available, you can't get it. Um, as an example, you know, Bold Bang said, suddenly lose one of your patients due to a lack of medical supplies. That causes moral distress because you you know when you trained in medical college or in nursing college, you know that this is a treatable thing, but this patient can't access the treatment, so that causes you a lot of distress. And if you do, if this happens repeatedly, then it really can harm you. And then compassion fatigue. So basically, it's what it sounds like. You know, you you can show compassion, but you know to repeatedly do that for so long kind of diminishes your emotional ability to care for patients. So these are things we can recognize in ourselves sometimes. And we talked about some of the factors that predispose that, that you shared in the chat, like work overload, lack of control in your work environment. Um, sometimes you have to spend a lot of time on things at work that you don't think are very important or don't advance your career. And if your work interferes with home life, meaning you work very long hours or many times patients call you when you're at home or the hospital calls you when you're at home, that can cause these things, burnout and compassion fatigue and moral distress. There's some personal factors that can affect it too. So being early in your career when you're less experienced, this can really impact um, you because you don't have the same coping skills yet. You just, you're new. Um, and then just personality things, just feeling like you don't have control over things. Um, a trip, if you feel like your success is just due to chance or luck instead of personal accomplishment, if you're overcommitted or you can't admit your mistakes, these are things that you can work on changing in your own perspective that actually help 
keep you from getting burnt out. And here are some protective characteristics of yourself that you may want to think about how you can cultivate. And Dr. Nicola is going to talk more about this in a couple minutes. Just being thorough. So um, if you have the time to check and make sure you've, you've identified all the things with a patient, that can help you feel like, okay, I did a good job because I checked everything. Having commitment and being committed to sort of growing and changing yourself and learning from these experiences. Hardworking, being caring, being rational being self-aware. And we know there are many impacts of burnout. That's why we really want to prevent it. There are more medical errors when, when healthcare providers are burnt out. Patients don't feel as satisfied. It takes longer for patients to recover. You know, we may accidentally do unprofessional conduct. Um, and we may just leave the profession altogether. So I'm gonna finish up with the last reflection point before I hand over to Dr. Nicola to talk about some practical things we can do to protect ourselves. So I want you to now think about what makes your job fulfilling or what makes you happy at work. And if you can share those things in the chat, we'll read them out. Just take a minute and think about what makes you happy at work, what makes work good for you. It doesn't have to be related to patients. It can be your colleagues. It can be the type of problems that you, you see patients with. Motivation and teamwork, that's a great answer. Thank you, Jessica. A good working environment. When I see children survive after rigorous teamwork uh, treatment, when I provide a deep connection, understanding, education, and the patient feels supported and seen, seen. When we can get the family on board. When we are all working in harmony. Knowing that by the end of it all, I did something else, something to ease the pain. Great, thank you so much. I love these answers. Patient smiles, good feedback from patients about me. When someone says thank you. Thank you for sharing those things. And these are really important things because these are what keep you going. So, you know, it's okay to think about the negative things about your work, like we did at the beginning, the things that make it really difficult, but these things are the things that will strengthen you to keep going. Leah has written good team and good networking, seeing improvements in those served. Great, thank you everyone for your answers. Good collaboration. And over time from research, we know there are many rewards to working in palliative care. So even if the patient dies, the patient can be healed, right? In some ways, the patient can have good pain and symptom control. You can significantly reduce their suffering and that can have a major impact on their quality of life. So, you know, palliative care, sometimes other doctors, other nurses will say, oh, why do you wanna do palliative care? It's so difficult. But this is why people are drawn to palliative care because you can have a major impact on quality of life and reducing suffering. And you get deep and positive relationships with patients and families that make them very satisfied. So that, I see a lot of comments in the chat about that. Sometimes working in palliative care changes your own perception of life and what's important in life, right? It helps you value life more because you see that life might be short. Um, you appreciate the joys in life and we talked about how it can be really satisfying to do a good job for a patient. And many times when we start out in our career, we feel that death of the patient is really a failure, a professional failure. And over time, if you can give good palliative care, you can see how that's not always a failure. Um, that you, know, you can treat a patient and they can die, but they can have a good quality of end of life. So I'm gonna hand over here to Dr. Nicola to continue to give us some practical tips about self-care. I'm gonna move ahead to your slides, Nicola. Thank you. So good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. Um, I just want to share with you some of, first of all, some of the myths that we have about uh, self-care. So if I could have the next slide, please, Megan. 
So often when we think about self-care, we think, oh, it's because, you know, it's selfish because we're doing this very big job. We're having to deal with very uh, intense patient caseloads, but it actually couldn't be further from, from the truth because if we don't look after ourselves and actually get rest and exercise, it's not going to come together. And if, as we do that, if we look after ourselves, we actually become more energetic and ready to do the job. It's actually one of the healthiest things you can do is to actually take time out to uh, look after yourself. Um, the other myth that often people ask me, they say that, oh, the effects of self-care are temporary. But if we're doing true self-care where we're thinking about looking after ourselves, it, it's, it's actually about that recharging. So true self-care is finding not only what helps you unwind, but what actually recharges you. Not only is it important to find something specific that works for you, it's about spending time being thinking those things through, having self-care activities, and that all has an increase so that we're putting sort of like emotional, uh, we're putting stuff back in the bank where with like with our cars that run out of petrol, we're putting petrol back in. So it's really important that we, we keep, it's not a one-time thing. The other myth, number three, if I can have the next slide, Megan. It's that some people say, oh, Nicola, it's just for women. Actually, whether you're male or female, it's working in palliative care. It's really, really important that we look after each other. Men are just as susceptible to stress and burnout. Any adult, male or female, can benefit from practice of regular self-care. Another thing uh, people say, they say, oh, it takes too long. You know, it's, but actually we are all busy, aren't we? All of us working in palliative care are busy people and it doesn't require a huge chunk of time from your busy day. So if when I was working in the refugee camp, one of the things I would do when I just felt I needed sort of a couple of minutes, I would walk the long way round before I went to see the next patient and just sort of look up at the sky, two minutes, and then I was ready for the next thing. It doesn't have to take too much time. Um, it's those little things that we put in our day that can really help us. Myth number five is self-care is doing anything that soothes you. Now this is really, really important because it's important that when you do self-care, it's something you enjoy doing. But if we overindulge in things like food or watching, if you've got access to television, watching too much television or drinking alcohol, all those sort of excesses actually has the opposite of self-care. So it's about supporting and promoting your health and wellness, and it shouldn't be addictive or harmful to your body. I'm not saying watching a program or having, you know, a bit of chocolate is, is, is not okay, you know, not okay, but it's fine, but it is all those excesses that then can cause two negative patterns. So it's really important to think about what do we do that's healthy and good for our body. Myth number six, self-care is the same for everyone. When I see uh, all the names on the list, uh, we're all very different people from different places and we all have very different uh, sets of challenges and stresses in our lives, which are different and issues that are different. So the way we unwind and recharge varies from person to person, whether you're somebody that, uh, recharges having people around you. You might be somebody that needs to have space. One of the ways I recharge is I, I, I work in Ethiopia and so I'm a coffee drinker. So one of the ways I would recharge is sitting drinking coffee with my friends. So it, it's about what is important and what helps each person. It, we have to think about that it's different for each one of us. Okay, and then if I can, so when people say, oh, self-care, sometimes they think, oh, this is only something you can do in the West that you have, um, you know, we don't have time, especially working in a humanitarian setting. But one of the things that I want you to think about is this very simple checklist. Um, I did this with a group of surgeons that I was working with, and we had very, very interesting answers. So how long 
has it been since you last properly had had a proper meal like not just a chocolate bar or a sandwich when was the last time how much water have you consumed in the last 24 hours often when we're running around we don't drink enough and that can affect it can give us headaches it can cause you know issues physically so it's really important when we're talking about self-care is things like making sure that you eat, making sure you hydrate. The other thing that is important is sleep. How some of you, when you're on call or when you're in, you know, caring for a patient, how many hours have you slept in the last 24 hours? So when you can, yeah, you sleep. Oh, no, yes. Hello? Okay. Um, Megan, can you go back to the, the final slide, please? Thank you. So the fourth point is how long has it been since you went outside or got some exercise? So, you know, that exercise doesn't have to mean going to a gym. It can literally be going for a walk around the camp or doing something where you're just outside and seeing something beautiful. And this is really key. Number five, when was the last time you met someone in person and you're not just discussing patients, that you're actually connecting on a social level? So the really, these five things, you know, we've got five fingers. So it's eat, hydrate, sleep, exercise and connect. So that's something that I would encourage you to think about in your own um, in your own practice, in your own personal lives, to really improve and support you as you work in palliative care. The other things that I just want to mention is that like having a buddy system where you can have somebody, where you have a colleague that you can sort of WhatsApp and you know connect and discuss things with, that can be very helpful. And one of the th other things that some of you mentioned on the chat was about, some of you said that you had negative teamwork some of you said that teamwork was very very good and I think that's something that really does help with our self-care that we do actually not only do we self-care but we also look out for each other in the settings that we're in so this is the practical things that I would uh, encourage you to think about as you um, continue in your practice thank you Okay, Esther, I think. Uh, Dr. Esther, do you want to help facilitate the time of discussion now? Hello, Erin, please go ahead oh, yeah. for, uh, for me. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry no I'm problem. Sitting Okay, so we've talked about a lot of things, and I know um, we've done a lot on the chat, but does anyone have a specific question? They can raise their hand um, or a comment. Uh, you can also put it in the chat if your background noise is uh, is a bit loud. <laughs> So on the chat, mostly uh, just really good job, impactful, uh, good information. Um, most humanitarian workers reach a breaking point, yet if they integrate self-care in their work schedule, it's, it can highly prevent burnout. Um, so I think, Rita, thank you for the comment. I think that just shows us uh, that, that you agree with, with what has been taught today. Okay, question. What if your team is not supportive? So maybe Dr. Nicola, you can take this one. Uh, what do you do if your team is not supportive and you don't have shared ideas around the care? So what if there's conflict uh, just in regards to the treatment? Okay, thank you. I think first of all, if there is, if there is uh, the team is not supportive, then one of the things that to do is to look for, for your own self personally, is to look for other support if you can't get it in your team, to get it from other people around you. But the main thing is if your team is not functioning, is to actually work on that together. And that involves sometimes sitting down together and having a facilitator, maybe somebody from outside, for you to actually look at some of the, what are we about? What are the issues? Is, it there, is there a conflict over the, the type of care we're giving? 
over particular cases and try and unpick that um, because having a strong team is really important. There are quite a lot of resources on teamwork that you can find on the internet. But I think first of all, it's about making sure that you're cared for in your setting, but then working with the team and maybe having some outside help to support you with that. Thank you. Um, there's another question, uh, maybe Dr. Megan. Um, which support can you give if you don't have enough medical supplies? So what do you, what can you do as a team when you even basic um, supplies, you can't uh, meet the need? How do you work together or support one another through those really difficult challenges? I think um, it, this, can, this is probably like the most challenging issue for, for humanitarian mm -hmm. settings because you know that things are out there, but you just can't access okay. them, right? And that's so hard, that like mismatch between what's possible and what you can deliver. Um, so some of it is identifying that that's what's causing you to stress. Right. And saying, this is why I feel this way. Um, and that's why I'm feeling moral distress. And, and then talking about it with your colleagues and saying, look, this is why we're feeling this way. Because having people who share your suffering makes your suffering less. So when mm. you're feeling this way, it helps to just talk to other people, even if they're experiencing the exact same thing. And then, you know, sometimes it's just, like you can't change everything, right? You can't, sometimes you really cannot change the situation. You can't make it better. So it's then like sort of letting go of that and saying, you know what, this is a problem I cannot change, you know, and I'm upset about it, but I have to like release it because it's beyond my control, right? So, because, you know, I think sometimes if you put a lot of energy, mental energy, emotional energy into feeling struggling with problems that you can't change at all, then you don't get anywhere, right? You, you know, if you have a problem that you can fix, like teamwork, where you know your team is not functioning very well, and you can do those things, Dr. Nicola said, to help your team function better, that's where you should put your energy. Um, you know, sometimes for if we don't have medicines, then you might say for this patient, I can't change it, but maybe I can work for the system so that in the future, the patients will get better care. And that gives you a way to like work on the problem and feel like you're fixing it, um, which is sometimes what you need to feel. You need to feel like I can make it better, even if it's not for this patient, it's for future patients. Yeah, that's really, uh, really helpful. Um, Dr. Nicola, uh, one question was, how best can we um, help advocate for self-care at work? So, so in many cases, uh, Possibly our participants are finding that they're shorter staff uh, or, or they do feel they literally don't have time to do some of these things, like take a break and eat. Um, so what can you do to advocate maybe to your supervisor or um, to your other colleagues uh, for self-care at work? I think one of the things that, we, you know, one of the premises of um, healthcare is that prevention is better than cure. And uh, often, I think one of the, if you're talking to your supervisor, to say that, you know, to talk about the fact that palliative care is a, it's a, a very rewarding, but also like Meg, Dr. Megan was saying, also it can be quite stressful. And to create a cohesive team for that to happen, um, it is important to do self-care. So one of the things that, you know, you can maybe come up with suggest, some suggestions so that say once a week, people, you know, have five minutes where they just sit and have a chat or, you know, very, it can be very simple things. One of the things that I found with one of the palliative care teams that I was working with was they were literally not drinking enough. It was in a very hot country, working in a refugee camp. And we realized that people weren't drinking enough. So making sure that everybody had water bottles and access to water. I know that sounds really simple, but it stopped people from having headaches. They stopped getting, you know, angry very easily because they were dehydrated. So it's looking to see within your setting what, just like Dr. Megan was saying, what is it that we can fix and what can we not fix? And to go to your supervisors with some very simple but um, positive ways of, of changing practice. Thank you. I see there's a hand up from Dr. Kantong uh, Eddy. Did you want to ask a question? Yes, thank you very much. 
have a question. Now about the, the burnout, I think like taking leave, means like leave out of like let's say work like one week leave is mm. one of the period that you can use to relax and overcome the burnout. But at times there are situations whereby you're challenged. Mm? During the time you're supposed to go and leave, you also try to look for some other extra work. So how do you overcome the scenario? Thank you. So what Sorry, do you do when the end of the question? Can you repeat what the do question? you do when you have your annual leave and then there's a possibility that a a low, um, some casual work comes up and you you know you actually have some time, although you're supposed to be taking holiday and relaxing, how do you um, how do you make the balance with your leave to make sure that you stay focused on relaxing when maybe you have a week off? I mean, I think it's a practice of, and I'm not going to say I'm super good at it, but the practice <laughs> of just mentally relaxing and being mindful. And I like what Nicola, Dr. Nicola shared about, you know, just sometimes between patients, like just walking the long way around the hospital. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes what I do is I just step outside for, for less than one minute and mm -hmm. I look at the sky and it's blue and the sun is shining on me. And I just take like two big breaths and close my eyes and just you know say like I'm alive and I'm in this place and it's like you know the sun shining on me is beautiful and like it's just these small things that can keep you going like obviously the things Nicola said you have to eat you have to sleep you have to drink enough water but sometimes like just these moments of mindfulness mm -hmm. other people mention like other like mindful self-care training I've done is like okay just before you enter the patient's room or the patients, it's hard because not all our patients have rooms, but, you know, before you enter the ward, just like pause and like take a breath and just like kind of it, think and be mindful inside your own mind saying like, I'm going to go in and I'm going to see the patients and I'm going to do a good job and just kind of like bring yourself to like a calmer, more relaxed state. Um, these are just like really quick things that can help. Um, mm -hmm. And then I think one other thing that really for many healthcare providers keeps you going is the satisfaction you get from doing a good job with the patient, right? Like if the patient is better, they have less pain, or you've just, you've made a connection with the patient that can make you feel really good. So um, you can't have that connection with every patient every day because it might take you too long and you have like 50 mm -hmm. or 70 patients to see, but if you can have that connection with one patient in a day and you can like notice it and be mindful of it, then that can sustain you. And what I used to do when I was working a very pal busy palliative care unit in Bangladesh and, you know, the day would be just crazy. And then we, we had an elevator. We went from the fifth floor down to the ground floor to leave the hospital. And when I was in the elevator and it was going down, it was very slow, old elevator. And it would go down and stop on every single floor on the way down. And I would use the time in the elevator or, you know, walking down the stairs or walking out of the building and just be like, okay, I did a good job today. And find one thing that you feel like I had a good connection with that patient. I sat with them. I looked in the eye and we had a good connection. And I would just take that and everything else. I would like push back mentally up the elevator and leave it in the hospital and not mm -hmm. take it with me out. So these are small strategies. I didn't really answer the question about leave. I'm going to stop and let Nicola answer that. I, I think the, leave, the thing with leave is, is a tricky one because I would say it's sort of knowing um, where you are. It's like, you know, if we're a glass of water, are you three quarters full, half full, a quarter full? You know, or you've just got a bit of water. Have you only got a few drops of water left in you at the end? If you've only got a few drops of water at the end, then you need to use the time to refuel. And it's sort of being able with self-care, we also have to self-assess. So that's why like, the, t the checklist that I gave you and the, the tool that uh, Dr. Megan used, those can also help us when we make those sort of decisions. Where are we? Could we actually, if we needed the money, did we, do we need to, you know, have we got the emotional capacity to take a bit more work on? I think it's a case by case and also situation, you know, situation um, thing. You can't make a blanket statement, but it's about assessing where we are and what we need for that time, because it, it is really important to refuel. 
Yeah, I think uh, just another comment on the leave. A, a lot of times uh, we're part of a bigger social system ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. So a lot of times in that leave, there are other people in your life that are counting on connecting with you. Um, of course, self-care is a lot about ourselves, but it's also about reconnecting with our family. Maybe uh, if your family is far, maybe there's a, a close friend that you can connect with. And, and they also might need that time to talk, to um, to engage with you. So I think it's probably both both sides. It's what we need to do to relax and then also how we can, can reconnect uh, outside of our palliative care work. Mm -hmm. um, Dr. Nicola, there's a really good question here from Bang Bull from MSF. Uh, he said, what can you do if you're working together with uncooperative healthcare uh, teams or personnel in, in critical times in our work? So maybe this is when people's prognoses are changing or when someone is um, at end of life within the last few days of life. Um, what do you do when people are not getting along? I think one of the things that's really important is that you keep it out of the room with where the patient is in. So if there is sort of disagreements amongst you, it's really important that you are together as you walk in the door. And as Dr. Megan says, when she walks in the door, sometimes just to say, right, I'm going to go in and see this patient. So first of all, keep it outside of the patient room. And then when it needs, you know, sometimes there are conflicts when it comes to patient care or how we should do things. And it is about unpicking that and undoing that and spending the time to discuss it. Um, it's really helpful if you, there is somebody who can work as a facilitator because so that it doesn't become personal because often the danger is we take it sort of on and it's our you know we talk about our patients and rather seeing like we're my my uh, one of my very good friends says that when there is a conflict you have to sit on the like a sofa you sit with the chairs together like facing the wall so the conflict is this side and you are sitting together so you're not sitting facing each other and so you're dealing with the problem rather than dealing with the conflict with each other and I think it's helpful to have people that can support you in that team. So it's important for managers to get involved if that's necessary to try and support and make sure that people have the right, the right time off if they need time out, if it gets so stressful. Uh, I'll just take one more question from the chat and then Rita has her hand up. Um, Dr. Megan, there's a question here about what can we do in self-care when we experience young patients who, who pass on? So when we talk about self-care, what is self-care related to grief and loss? Um, and how do we manage those emotions um, to help us be motivated to keep coming back to work and not going out? Yeah, I think it's really hard, right? Because we always feel like children shouldn't die and they die of things that we feel are like preventable or treatable in other situations, right? Like cancer, like, you know, or I had a patient last week with spina bifida. It's, it's not technically a life-limiting condition in certain circumstances. So I think it's, I think part of it is just acknowledging mm -hmm. the loss and the sadness of the loss and accepting that, right? A little bit like we teach our patients and families to do when, when their loved one dies is like, you have to acknowledge the loss and sort of like process it as a loss and say like that was hard that was sad I'm you know grieving that you know especially if you lose a patient you know when you're resuscitating them you know they have sepsis or something treat you know kind of treatable um, and then I think many times what supports us is our team mm -hmm. right because you can't really go home and tell your family oh I resuscitated this patient they died and it was really sad because like then your family is like super sad too and like they don't want to hear about it um so you have to talk to your team because they understand. And then I think it's about telling yourself that you did a good job, you know, with the, the limits of what you had available, you did the best you could and you did, you did well, good for the patient. Um, and then finding something you did well, you know, like, did you talk to the family well afterwards, you know, and give them comfort instead of just saying, you know, you know, before you might've just said, I'm, I'm sorry, we did everything and walked away. But now maybe because of palliative care training, you know more how to talk to them a bit better. So then saying, okay, I did a good job. There's like a, there's a, there's a piece of good in there, even if 
you know, the overall, the situation isn't good. And, you know, like I deal with my job every day is dying children, right? So there's, there's always going to be children who die. And the way that I cope with that is to say, I made it less bad. Their family is going to recover and go on in life. I'm like, of course, you don't ever recover from the loss of your child completely, but they will have less complicated grief because I supported them and the child didn't suffer as much. But like, ultimately, you can't change the perhaps the disease and how it progresses and that they are going to die from it. Yeah, and I think this is one of the reasons that even Dr. Megan and the team in Bangladesh and our team in East Africa continues to do uh, these calls. So we don't feel so isolated in the, the challenges and the grief of losing patients. Um, so I think the, our, our WhatsApp group, and even when we have these kinds of discussion, people sharing on the chat, these all are actually therapeutic ways to deal with uh, the ongoing grief and loss that we experience uh, as healthcare workers. Um, I'll just take one more question, Rita. Do you want to unmute? Sorry, I know your hand, your hand must be very tired. I hope you're not actually holding your hand up. <laughs> um, so why don't you go ahead, Rita, and then we'll move to the cake. Welcome, Rita. I'm Erin, and I'm here with us. Um, being in a refugee setting and um, not being able to have self-care, and uh, also show what measurements have been put in place or that we have come up with to see that uh, we try and um, give ourselves self-care. Given that uh, I'm a mental health practitioner, you realize that in most cases you interact with clients and you end up getting secondary trauma. And um, over time, it becomes too severe and you also need therapy. So. My first time working with a mental health organization, it was really hard. Um, I got secondary trauma and I could hardly realize who I was at the moment. So I realized I had to do more of uh, the exercises in the morning and uh, do more of uh, the meditation, be able to take in self-care activities whereby we even um, developed like um, an activity at work whereby we meet every month, once every month after contributing a small amount of money, like 10,000 Ugandan shillings. So we spend that whole day together as colleagues and uh, we get to share experiences, which I believe is also part of self-care. So I thought that uh, maybe colleagues from um, the refugee setting could actually pick a leaf from that and um, maybe it could help a person. But I'm so grateful for the work being done and I've learned a lot. Thank you. Arita, it's really inspiring to hear that. Uh, although I am really sorry to hear of the secondary trauma that you and your team have experienced, uh, it, it's, it's really inspiring to hear that you have come up with your own ideas of things that will work in your workplace. And it seems like your team agrees. Uh, and it seems like those are some really uh, insightful ideas of what to do. Uh, not to necessarily, we can't always get rid of the secondary trauma. You all have been called to work in very difficult settings and work with people that are suffering greatly. Um, so we know that, that the secondary trauma is going to happen, but it sounds like you have really tried uh, to work hard to, to, to walk. What was it Dr. Jesse was telling us uh, on one of the calls to sit with, sit with suffering? And as you're doing that, realizing that you are greatly affected by it, but you're not going to just um, just let it impact you and and possibly cause you to leave your your profession. You're you're doing things to make sure you can keep doing the work. So thank you, Rita. Um, okay, so you can continue. There's a few other faculty on the call today. So if you have any specific questions, don't hesitate to put them on the on the chat. We'll move to the case presentation. Um, okay. So today we're going to talk about a specific case uh, for uh, self-care and supporting our healthcare teams related to our palliative care uh, patients. So this case study is a four-month-old baby 
uh, who presented to our hospital with an enlarged head uh, for about a month and lower back lesions since birth. They were diagnosed with myelomeningocele and hydrocephalus. A rapid malaria test uh, showed positive results and the patient was experiencing respiratory distress and fever. She started on IV antibiotics and the malaria treatment, uh, exploring possible transfers uh, for further treatment for shunting and neurosurgery. Um, so you can see on the, on the right-hand side there, uh, she was diagnosed with open spina bifida. So in summary, this was uh, the four-month-old child with hydrocephalus and an acute illness, uh, the malaria, pneumonia, or possible meningitis. The patient was living in a rural area, far from any possible hospital which could uh, provide the shunting treatment. She would, uh, they would need to be transferred to another country for this procedure to happen. Um, and the neurosurgical centers were in nearby countries. Sorry, give me one minute. <laughs> I can keep going, Erin. Oh, she didn't advance the slides. <laughs> so the, the reality was that the patient wasn't gonna be able to get uh, the treatment because of where they were located and where they lived. The team, the healthcare team, uh, discussed with their advisors over telemedicine, and they agreed that the shunt was not appropriate in this setting where the patient was. And for the reasons uh, that are listed be below, it was due to lack of available expert, uh, expertise to follow up, a high likelihood that the shunt would block in the short or medium term. Care in a neuro neurosurgical hospital would not be free, so they would have a large financial um, uh, challenge with that. There was previous agreement that the hospitals would support the patient, but this was discontinued because of poor outcomes for the children and the huge risk uh, when international transfers occurred. And unfortunately, there was a high likelihood of death during and around the time of transfer. And we, uh, the team discussed that it would be quite traumatic uh, for the family to experience that. Recommendation was given for palliative care. The ventricular uh, tap could help relieve the intracranial pressure, um, but despite the symptoms, uh, these kinds of treatments uh, would be very short-term. Um, short-term relief. The fluid would always accumulate and it would um, unfortunately be an easy route for infection for the patient. Uh, we could prolong the patient's life, but it would not change or improve their outcome. So after the treatment plan for palliative care was discussed, uh, at, the family accepted the plan and they decided they wanted to stay in the hospital for further care. The baby did recover from, uh, sorry, there's a typo, um, her pneumonia and malaria and stayed on the ward uh, for comfort and, and focus of the care for the patient. Unfortunately, the patient rapidly deteriorated three weeks later, but died peacefully on the ward. Several of the nurses on the team did become very attached to the baby as, uh, as they were taking care of the baby all the time and found it really hard to cope with the death. One of the pediatric nurses approached the pediatrician later that week asking why the patient was not resuscitated. And at that point, the pediatrician uh, decided that it was really important that the team debrief um, the case. So now that we know this case uh, situation and this patient and some of the complications the family uh, experienced as well as the team, here are some questions that I thought we could uh, try to answer together. Uh, so uh, you can answer in the chat, but we'll also allow some time um, uh, if people felt like they wanted to unmute. So in this uh, situation, what are some of the features of this case that could impact the nurses or team members um, as they experience moral distress? So what, what could cause them to experience moral distress uh, for this patient who died in their setting? So it's a complicated case, but um, 
what are some of the causes of why we, even ourselves, experience moral distress in palliative care, uh, especially in limited resource settings uh, or refugee camps, humanitarian responses? Okay, so one is um, not being able to get the right treatment for the patients and not being able to get a shunt. The age of the child being only four months, yep. Yeah. Feeling hopeless that we're not able to give full medical support. Not having the right equipment. And the efforts uh, put in to have the patients get better. Yes, the patient did recover from that acute illness, uh, but then of course, because of their primary diagnosis, they died. Inability to provide appropriate management. Not having access to care, not the optimal treatment, dying in a young, at a young age, um, limited resources to provide the care and support we need. And I think this goes a little bit to the comment uh, during our discussion time where we talked about not being able to uh, provide the care uh, and the dilemma that we experience, um, knowing that in, in certain situations, it would have been possible for the patient to get treated. There wasn't many things we could do to help, expensive procedures, feeling helpless, inadequate services. So I think as Dr. Megan uh, mentioned earlier, even talking openly about moral distress that uh, us as healthcare workers experience actually helps. We acknowledge the problem or the issue. We do also acknowledge that there are times where we may not be able to change the situation for the specific patient. Uh, but this leads into the next question. What can we do as a team to support one another in situations like this, where we experience extreme amounts of moral distress, even as Rita was saying, possibly secondary trauma um, of a child dying at a young age? What can we do or what could the team do to support one another during this time? Yeah, this is a really good one. Uh, Aduna uh, mentioned um, avoiding blaming one another. That's really important. <coughs> Excuse me, especially as our patients, um, as our patients die or deteriorate, it's very important that we maintain team cohesiveness. So we don't want to have a conflict amongst our team. Uh, so that's really important allowing our staff to vent or cry, show their emotions, feel angry about the situation, that's really important. Um, having the case team meeting by the pediatrician was really helpful, and I think that's really true. Identifying that there is, um, there is distress uh, amongst the team members and allowing people to talk about it is really important. Being close together, Remind uh, that while medically we can provide comfort care, but not healing, we also have the power to impact the situation through psychosocial and spiritual care, watching out for one another, that's really good. The team needs to be well-informed to acknowledge the truth. Providing counseling and encouraging uh, words to one another, supporting each other, sharing our emotions. Early debrief of the team on the prognosis prepares the team. So making sure that all the team members are aware of the situation. Uh, one minute, but please, I, I can't keep up the, the chat, but keep the comments coming. I'll be, I'll be right back, sorry. Thanks, Aaron. I'll just keep reading out the comments. Um, leaning on one another spiritually, educating the caregiver, remembering that we can always do something, even if it be simple, we are not hopeless. And I want to, I want to acknowledge that. So, you know, sometimes you, you get really stuck on the thing that you can't give, like, you know, the team was really like, oh, we can't get this patient to get this shunt. 
because like that would have kind of cured the the myelomeningocele hydrocephalus um, or the hydrocephalus part, which is what the patient died of. But, you know, if you're a neurosurgeon in one of these centers where they send these patients, you experience the same moral distress because you can't fix all these patients, right? And you put the shunt in, but then the patient gets complications and you don't have an ICU or a neuro ICU. So then a whole bunch of your patients actually die post-operatively because they don't have like good enough nursing care and an ICU setting. So the moral distress happens no matter where you are in the system. You know, I have colleagues who are pediatric oncologists in low income settings, so they can treat children with cancer, you know, even though maybe you can't in a refugee camp. So they see children with cancer, but they still have moral distress because they can't treat all the patients and they can't treat them to that level that they know is possible in certain settings, maybe. They don't have bone marrow transplant. Again, they don't have ICU settings. So lots of patients come really advanced. So I think just knowing that, like, don't get stuck on if only we had been able to send them to neurosurgery, they would have, this wouldn't have happened. It's probably still would have happened. So I think that perspective when you're talking in your debrief can help. Thanks, Megan. Um, okay, and then we can move to the, to the last, uh, question, what would you do if you're involved in this case uh, to make sure that you had a personal self-care plan or some of the examples that we had shared today? What would you do um, possibly during while the patient was in the hospital uh, with you and then, and then shortly after they died? What are some things that you could encourage your colleagues as well as yourself to do? Okay, Rita shared that she would accept what had happened uh, and make sure that there were measures in place um, uh, for better equipment to try and create a timely referral plan. Um, so maybe Rita's thinking more of the system approach when she sees that there's um, lack of access, trying to put her efforts into to supporting that. Uh, someone says, listening to ourselves, being there for the team, making sure we have counseling for the family, um, leaving the situation in uh, and focusing, uh, as Dr. Megan gave the example of the ele elevator, what I could do for the patient. <coughs> talking about the referral system, making sure that we um, take enough water, sustenance for our, our daily living, making sure we have enough sleep, being compassionate and professional. regular self-care sessions to debrief. I think this is really important. Uh, I'm not sure how all the teams are set up where you work, um, but even having a, a weekly team meeting is a way to talk about difficult cases. You may not debrief every case, but at least in cases where there seems to be moral distress, it's really important. Um, Okay, some people are saying keeping busy to avoid thinking about the case. I think, I think that can help uh, maybe with things like exercise or doing social things with your friends, not to dwell on these difficult cases. Make sure you have good communication, acknowledging the loss as a team, allowing for privacy, being compassionate. These are all really, really good, uh, good comments. And I think um, one unique thing about this course that we offer is that, uh, that these are um, things that you can actually uh, teach also to your colleagues. You may actually be one of the only people in this course learning some of these ways to, to provide better teamwork um, and to talk about self-care, but I would strongly encourage you, um, if you can, to share some of these ideas uh, on your team or with your team. These are all really good ideas. Um, so I'll stop sharing uh, my screen now. Um, we have a little bit more time and my son has had now his fourth cookie. 
Want to say hi to everyone? I'm isolating with three kids uh, in Canada, so I guess everyone's going to have cookies today. But anyways, we have about 10 more minutes before we end the call. Is there Are there any other questions, uh, even or comments about the full course? You guys have done amazing. I've I've been really honestly so proud of, of you and I will work on the attendance. Um, don't don't uh, stress about that. Uh, I'll make sure I follow up with those comments that you shared with me. But does anyone have a comment about today or the course in general that they'd like to share? Uh, this may be your last chance as we'll, we won't be meeting again. Welcome to raise your hand or put a chat coming in the chat. Yes, welcome, Rita. You can unmute. Um, thank you, Erin, for the opportunity given to me again. Uh, I would like to tell you that uh, the session and the overall course has been a very informative one with a lot of uh, like-minded practitioners whose first-hand information has come in handy in the palliative care field. I feel I am well versed with the necessary information to keep on doing my work. And uh, I want to be very, very, very open to you that I'm so grateful with immense happiness that I've been able to learn. And I will not stop at this. I'll also share the information with my colleagues who couldn't have an opportunity to take part in this course. Thank you so much. I'm so excited, oh God, I'm so excited, thank you. Thank you so much, Rita. I think um, I think one thing uh, that we've learned through some of these online training courses is that it doesn't stop here. So there are a lot of uh, new opportunities that may come up for virtual learning, but also uh, just being part of the community, um, there may be different opportunities that might come up in your, uh, in your region um, to get more information. And please do spread the word about palliative care. We, we will continue to run these courses uh, so your colleagues can also have access, your supervisors, even administrators. If anybody you think that could be a greatly impacted by the content is welcome to join. Um, Peter, do you have a comment? Yes, thank you so much for giving me this opportunity. I'm so delighted and uh, I'm here expressing my gratitude for the session. It has been so helpful, though to be very open, I didn't attend them all, but those sessions that I've attended were so uh, helpful. And especially today, uh, I think of like, I should have my own book. I'll be checking uh, what I have done for the last, from morning for within 24 hours. The self-care, I'll be checking personally as Peter by myself. So it is so helpful. It will help me and it will help other people and patient, other patient. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Peter, for the comments. Bang, uh, Bo, would you like to comment? It's a bit hard to hear you. Do you maybe take out the earphone? Hello. Hello. Yeah, try now. Hello. Yeah, perfect. Yes. I think it's very good. I think uh, the training is very crucial. Uh, as we uh, attend this training, it's very good for us. Patient, the first time also for us, we have a good training. The one I can say is nice and other place like this one, because this is the one we want to have a good training. As we uh, get that we feel out the first time for us to attend this study, 
article to good for us to send it to our other colleagues so that the patient care for our people will be very good. So just to provide another one, so we can also be more helpful for us. As I'm speaking, we are the front fight uh, uh, this training, so whereby uh, it's good also for us to have more knowledge so that we can help our patients. Uh, of course, we have no uh, we have no patient support in cancer also for us to manage it here. So just yes, to send them home. I think we, if you have enough knowledge, so it's good for us also to create a word which can make them to stay there to so help us to quite have enough uh, knowledge to serve them to spend the process of helping them. Thank you. Thank you so much. I didn't catch it all, but I, I do appreciate you taking the time to comment. Um, uh, Ali, would you like to go ahead? Maybe we'll have you as the last comment. Ali? Uh, you can just unmute, Ali. Oh, we can't hear you. Hello, everyone. Dr. Irene. It was very interesting, good session for palliative care of this evening. And it will help us in the future. And uh, it's very essential for us to guide our clients who are, who are, who are terminally ill, and we can still uh, help them in the future. And it's very nice uh, for us. It will help us. And thank you. And I also thank all past ones who are hearing me and uh, who participated in the Bulge of Care program. Thank you, Erin. Well, thank you so much, everyone. I think we will, we probably could talk for the next 10 uh, or 15 minutes about the things that we've learned. And I think that just shows this kind of community is really helpful for us to create a bond amongst one another uh, in things that we have in common uh, and, and to continue to support one another. We most likely will be holding another course like this one, the 11 week course, probably starting in October. Um, I know that there are many of you that weren't able to attend every session. So you are welcome again to review the recorded session. We would like to uh, open the registration for people that didn't make it to this course, but again, you'll be you'll be welcome to join uh, the course again if that's something that you would like to to do. Um, I'll be sending around uh, an announcement about that closer to when we open the course, and we will be in touch with you regarding the certificate. It will be a virtual certificate that will be sent to you via email, uh, and we will be happy to uh, update the attendance. Uh, and, and just make sure everyone has um, everything accurately. So please be patient with us, but thank you so much again. Uh, and um, we have representation from KEPCA, who is our partner in this. Uh, Makulin is the executive director for uh, the Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association in Nairobi. Unfortunately, she's in a location where uh, she can't uh, speak today, but she wanted to thank all the participants for uh, coming every week and showing so much engagement. Uh, and hopefully uh, in the future, we can continue to support one another. Um, I don't know if Dr. Megan, you want to say anything on behalf of CalChase, another partner in the course? Uh, Erin, can I say, I give you one comment also? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I could say uh, about the attendance of the absent, yeah. Majority of the majority of the bus ones, I think they were on the on class. Yeah. Kindly check well on the attendance list. Yeah. Yeah. Kindly. So when we do, um, just so everyone's aware, when we do the attendance, we do track people from about ten or fifteen minutes into the call. If you've missed more than ten or fifteen minutes of the beginning of the call, chances are you've missed the lecture. So that's why we check attendance at the beginning. I know a lot of people do come in late. Um, so that would be the reason why you may not, you might have been there for the second half of the call. Um, that's why you may not have been marked as, as, as attending. 
Um, but I will try my very best. If you, if you feel like you have attended the course and you've learned the content, I am happy to adjust the attendance. And, and it's just an administrative thing. It's not a big deal. Um, so you just have to give me time. There's many people, even as the call today, there's 90 participants. So that time, uh, 10 or 11 weeks will be quite a bit for us to go through. So just give us time, we'll work on it. Um, this is not, again, a university course. This is not a postgraduate degree. It is an 11 week um, certificate in learning the beginnings of palliative care for humanitarian settings. So, um, uh, so also remember that. Um, but if there are ways that we can continue to support you uh, to access more education, to, to access more courses, I know Dr. Megan uh, just shared that there are some courses through the International Children's Palliative Care Network that are free that you can do on your own. They're self-guided modules. Um, we always have access to different education material that you can that you can go through. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, let's. We can just close the call with Megan. Um, Thank you, Erin. Yeah, I just want to say on behalf of Pal Chase, who's the Palliative Care and Humanitarian Aid Situations and Emergencies, and is a co-coordinator um, of this course, um, supporting Kepcha in, uh, and Erin specifically in doing the course that we're very happy to support and really proud that you guys have joined and had a fantastic experience. And I would just encourage you to stay on the WhatsApp group because we'll continue to share various links. And the ICPCN courses that I mentioned, those are online but they don't have any Zoom component. You just work through them yourself and there are questions and assignments. And those courses, if you complete them, you get a certificate that is associated with the University of South Wales. So those might be good. They just came last week. They're brand new courses um, that we wrote, Aaron and I and a few other people Thanks. have written them. So um, you can do those on the e-learning site of the ICPCN and we'll share more information um, as we get it from ICPCN in the next few days on the WhatsApp group and by email. So thank you, everyone, and congratulations on completing your first palliative care course. Thank you, uh, Dr. Nicola, as well, and Dr. Megan for the class today. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys all online. Please stay connected uh, and don't hesitate to share cases that are difficult. That's one of the reasons faculty are here uh, to give advice and support uh, as you continue to do your work. Um, so thank you, everyone. I hope you have a really good day wherever you are and be safe. Good. Welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. All. Thank you, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bye. Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank, you. Thank you, all faculty members. Yeah. Thank you very much. Bye bye. It's been learning a lot. Wonderful. Thank you, our course mates. Bye bye. And we can meet again. Yeah. Hope that we, uh, we are connecting. Good presentation. With each other again. Mm. Thank you, bye -bye. Sean. Hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. I'll uh, I'll stop the call for now. It's great. It was great to meet you all, and uh, 